Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. I'm David Bird with Reality Reimagine. I'm an award-winning photographer and Photoshop artist that specializes in fantasy composite art. And I first must begin today's video by apologizing for the severe lack and delay of content to the channel over the past two weeks. We have had a very uh, tragic event take place and I have some very uh, important thoughts and, and things that I want to talk about. But I want to talk about that at the end of today's video because the other information today talking about the best computer components that you need to look for to build a great computer for Photoshop, that takes precedence and I don't want to start off today's video on a negative place. So I'm sincerely asking that you will stay through all the content today and watch the end. And if you already are familiar with technology or you want to skip ahead, then if you look at the description below, there's going to be the time code chapters below. Skip ahead to the end because again, I would like to pay respect to those events and share some of that uh, information in my thoughts. So let's get started by talking about technology and ultimately giving you a guide on the technology that's most important to look for when you consider a new computer, either you're building one or a pre-built computer to run a program like Photoshop. I get that question all the time. What's, what's, what's the best computer that I need for the Photoshops? What do I need? I've been asked this question for years and I love it because I love tech, but tech is forever changing. It evolves so quickly and it can be daunting to the average consumer who doesn't stay atop of all of that. And I certainly understand that, especially the way that they um, categorize technology it has become confusing and model numbers and, and versions and megahertz, gigahertz and so forth. It, it's all confusing. I want to demystify some of that today and give you some explanations about the key elements that you need to look for when you're building a computer to be able to run a graphics software program like Photoshop. Now, a few disclaimers up front. First, we're gonna be talking about technology for desktop computers for PCs. The last time that I had an Apple, I was playing Oregon Trail on it and I got the family all the way to Oregon without dysentery. So I'm amazing and I, I don't know very much about Macs. I know Macs are great computers and they used to be recommended as if you were doing Photoshop, you needed a Mac, you didn't want to use a PC. I, that's no longer relevant. And if anybody's holding on to that, then fight me in the comments. However, I'm sure there's wonderful resources online to be able to find out the next best MacBook Pro or whatever. So unfortunately, I don't know anything about that. We'll just be talking about PCs today. We're also going to be using Photoshop as a baseline, but in the modern age of graphic software, most of this software is relying upon the same technology in the computer that Photoshop is. They're all kind of one and the same of the demands of the computer. So using Photoshop as a baseline, all this information is applicable to other video and graphic software and editing programs. So take that information with you. Now, this information, there's gonna be a lot. I'm gonna be throwing a lot of details at you, acronyms and so forth, and I know that can get confusing. But the goal is this. Far too often, I think consumers who are not tech savvy, which is totally fine, they go to Amazon, they go to Costco, and they, they look at something and they start by price. And they say, okay, well, this is a $1,600 laptop. So then they start looking for the $1,400 or the 1200 and try to decipher why they are different with the goal of getting the best machine that they can afford that will carry them forward for three or four years. I want to give you the explanations of these computer components and what's important because it will enable you to be able to decipher the descriptions of these computers. You'll understand the hardware that's going inside of it. You'll understand why computer companies are notorious for robbing Peter to pay Paul. They will say, hey, this amazing new Intel i7 i9 chip CPU. But the video card inside of it is outdated. So I want you to be able to look at the information, all of that, that hieroglyph Sanskrit of the descriptions of a computer and understand the key components and know what to look for and how it works. And ultimately, if it's a valuable purchase to carry you forward for a few years using Photoshop or other video editing software and so forth. So we're going to start by talking about the five key elements of a computer. Then we're going to talk about the demands of a program like Photoshop on those key elements of a computer. Then we're going to hit up Amazon. I'm going to show you recommendations that I have for all the different components to either build a desktop computer. And then I'm going to show you a pre-built laptop so you can decipher the information that's in there and be able to make some good choices itself. So first, computer components. The five key components are a CPU, a motherboard, the video card, or also known as the GPU, memory, and a hard drive. RAM, memory, hard drive. The CPU processes all the information. It's the brain of the computer. The motherboard is where everything connects to it. 
And the motherboard is important because it needs to be able to throttle and handle all that information that's moving about. The CPU calls to information that is stored in the memory or in the RAM. The hard drive has the information like the software and your pictures and your music and so forth all written to the hard drive itself. The CPU will call to the hard drive for some of that information, but what makes it faster is for it to be able to call to the memory. So the memory, having more memory and having faster memory enables the CPU to be able to access that information and to be able to do whatever you're asking it to do quicker. The video card or the GPU works in tandem with the CPU. It's going to handle some of the responsibilities of the CPU to be able to render things for you, to be able to save things for you, video games and so forth. When you're using Photoshop and you use the, the mixer brush or the spot healing brush or any brush, when you see that brush moving around on the desktop, that's the video card rendering that for you. When you use a video editing software, when you use a 3D program, the video card is rendering a lot of that information. It's trying to take the load off of the CPU so the CPU can do other things as well at the same time. Now, there's other key elements and peripherals of a computer. But those are the five core elements of it. And some of those mother, uh, other more important things are usually included into the motherboard or into the tower that you put all these components into itself or to the laptop. And you know things like uh, USB 2.0 ports in a laptop or in a computer versus USB 3.0, USB-C. Understanding how data is transferred from those how the power demands are of those and how things like hard drives, external hard drives, can speed up and have more accessibility to the computer if you're using something like USB-C or Thunderbolt connections versus something old like a USB 2.0 connection. But again, I want to stay on those core five elements if we can, but we'll talk about those peripherals in a little while. Photoshop. Photoshop in the past used to be very CPU heavy. It needed, it needed all those components, but it was CPU heavy and then kind of memory. And then as it evolved, it needed more and more memory to be able to meet its efficiency and its peak efficiencies. In the modern age, Photoshop kind of needs all five. It needs a really good CPU, really good memory, fast memory, a great uh, video card, and a fast hard drive. And then of course, a motherboard that is current gen to connect and be able to process all that information. Can you get away with some older components? Yes, of course. And if you go to adobe.com, they will have the system, minimum system requirements and the recommended system requirements for Photoshop. And I was pleasantly surprised when I looked at the minimum system requirements because it's definitely pushing for more modern tech in the past three or four years. And that's a testament to the evolution of Photoshop and how much power is being put into that program and subsequently other programs as well. They're all, like I said, one and the same, and they're demanding a lot from your computer. So, with the understanding of the five key components of a computer, knowing the demands of Photoshop, let's do my favorite thing around the Thanksgiving in the America, the American holiday of Thanksgiving. For you folks who are watching outside of America, around Thanksgiving, we have something called Black Friday, where every vendor on earth has everything on sale, and we all go crazy buying stuff. I'm sure you all do too. And it's a wonderful time of year to go bankrupt. So let's hit up Amazon and go shopping. To get started, we're gonna talk about CPUs and I'm going to move through this information as quickly as I can and try to give you just the most pertinent information. I don't wanna to go too fast and overwhelm you, but we do have a lot to talk about, so try to stay with me on this. If you have questions at any point, hit me up in the comments below and also in the description below is the links to everything that we'll be talking about today. These are not Amazon affiliate links. I don't get paid for them. They're just there so you don't have to go and search for them. So starting with CPUs, there are two major companies for CPUs. There's Intel and AMD. Intel has been king of the hill for a long, long time. Their chips were the best and AMD was classically the affordable budget chip that you would see in things like a Chromebook or a laptop that's like $250 or less. However, over the past year and a half to two years, AMD has very much been rising in fame and in power with their chips. They put a lot of money in research and development. At the time of this recording, they have launched the Ryzen system of their chips and the Ryzen chips, specifically the 3000 
6000 series and the new 5000 series that was just launched a couple months ago, these chips are faster and more powerful than Intel. They have essentially pushed Intel off the hill and they are now more powerful. Intel is still a good chip. Intel's chips are traditionally more expensive than AMD. They've kept their price points right where they've been. They've raised them incrementally every year. AMD is raising the price of their chips, but for most of them, those chips are still less expensive than the Intel equivalent that can come as close to matching the power of the AMD chip. So bottom line, AMD is faster, it's better, and it's cheaper for most of them. Intel is still a good chip. If you have a pre-built system, if you're looking at a laptop or a desktop with a pre-built system that has an Intel chip inside of it, no problem at all. It's a good chip. AMD is just faster and it's better. So let's start understanding and breaking the code of how to understand all of the information on how these are categorized. So AMD Ryzen is the name of the chip, and this is the series nine. So there's three, five, seven, and nine. Ultimately, the AMD Ryzen 3 is less powerful than the AMD Ryzen 9. This is the speed, the 3900. This is giving you the idea of the overall power of the chip itself with this little mon model number of XT. Now, this is $499 at the time of this recording. The next one down is an AMD Ryzen 9 3900 X, not XT, and it's $449, $50 cheaper minor variations to the theme. So when you see that and you see AMD Ryzen 9 3900 XT, and then you see one that says AMD Ryzen 9 3900 X, there's just subtle little variations, not that big of a difference. So if you can afford the 499, go for it. If you wanna save a little bit of money and put that money towards some of the other things we're gonna talk about, then look at that 3900 X or something along those lines. That's how you understand this part of the chip itself. Here is the key part the 12 cores. The 12 cores are essentially like 12 little mini CPUs inside the CPU itself. When Intel started with their chips long ago, it was a single core. When Duo Core came out, it was revolutionary because it was like two CPUs inside of one. Four core, eight core, 10 core, 12 core, 16 core, and so forth. That's the key that you wanna look at. That's, that's the measure that we're looking at. The more cores, the faster that the CPU can multitask and process information, the quicker it can process all of that information, it will be a stronger CPU for you. So look at those cores. Now, with that being said, let's jump over to Intel. Intel systems, Intel Core i7, same kind of thing with the Ryzen. It was i3, i5, i7, and i9 are the structures and series numbers for the Intel chips. i3 is less powerful than i9, i9 is at the top. This number, the 10,700K, this is essentially telling you, yes, a model number of it, just like the 3000 series for the Ryzen. However, this is also indicating the 10th generation of this chip. So currently in my desktop computer, I'm using an Intel i7 chip that is a seventh generation chip. It has some of the same specs. It has six cores instead of eight and uh, its speeds and so forth are a little bit comparable. However, it's not just the speeds of it. It's also all of the software, if you will, inside the chip itself. Those things get improved and that is what will designate a new generation of chips. How it can connect with the motherboard, how it connects with the other pieces of hardware and software. They need to grow the software and evolve it inside the CPUs. That's where you get those generations or series numbers with Ryzen. So again, I'm using an Intel i7 seventh generation chip, but I actually bought this specific chip two days ago and I'm replacing my old i7 chip because my i7 chip has six cores in it. This one has 12. I'm going to double the processing power of my computer. I had to buy a new motherboard as well and we're gonna talk about those in just a second. So last little bit that I wanna talk about with CPUs to give you a kind of a baseline understanding of it is the overall speed of the processor itself. So as we're looking at this AMD Ryzen 9 3900 XT, it's got 12 cores, that's good. That's one of the key things and factors we wanna look for. It's speed, 4.7 gigahertz. This is what it can do at its baseline of what it is when it comes out the box and it goes into the motherboard itself. One other minor little thing I want you to look at and I'll explain what this means in a second. This processor socket needs a socket AM4. This means the motherboard. What motherboard it can actually fit into. And we'll look at that here in a second when we look at motherboards itself. So 12 cores, speeds, at 4.7 for the AMD. Let's go to the Intel. The Intel's at 
This is its newest chip, 10th generation, it's supposed to be super duper fast. But if we look up here in the description, it says up to 5.1 gigahertz unlocked. What does this mean? This means that if you unlock, the chip is unlocked so that it can be overclocked. You can go into the software, the chip itself, it's called the BIOS. You're gonna go into that and tell the chip, I want you to actually go faster than what you come out the box, baseline of 3.8. This has been done for years, overclocking CPUs, and it can be done relatively safely and have no problems at all, as long as two key factors are paid attention to. One, you need to know what you're doing, and number two, you need proper cooling for the CPU and proper cooling for the desktop tower or the laptop itself. Overclocking a CPU is like taking a six cylinder engine and driving as fast as possible like you would in a 12 cylinder engine. You can do it for a short amount of time, but it's gonna overheat the engine. The, the oil, the antifreeze, the coolants can only keep up for so long. Overclocking a CPU is kind of the same fundamental. You can overclock a 3.8 gigahertz CPU and take it up to 5.1, considerably increasing its power and speed at a price it's gonna overheat it. So that's where the cooling comes into play. You wanna make sure you have good cooling for the CPU, good cooling for the tower, the laptop, whatever case, all these peripherals and components are inside so it doesn't overheat. If it does overheat, it's gonna destroy the CPU and most likely cause damage to the motherboard itself and damage to the other peripherals. So those are the key factors. Also the other little minor thing when we were talking about that socket AM4, this LGA1200 is essentially the socket of what motherboard this chip will fit inside. So let's go to motherboards, but just quick recap. AMD and Intel. The Ryzen chip, the AMD series of the 3000 series, faster and better than Intel. In some of those chips, significantly better. Some pretty close. Intel is still a good chip. AMD just launched their Ryzen 3, 5, 7, and 9 series, but the 5000 series. The 5000 series is better than the 3000 series by a pretty good amount. However, they just launched and they are sold out across planet Earth and they're hard to find. I think the 5000 series has one that goes up to 20 cores. I know it has one that goes up to 16. So if you want more cores and more processing power, you'd have to go to the newest series. The 3000 series is pretty good for AMD. Intel series, definitely 10th generation, 9th generation. You don't want to go any, you don't want to go to 8th generation or behind because that's just too far behind. It isn't that they're bad, it's just outdated. So for the numbers especially, you want to try to stay with that 10th generation. Now, as you can see, this 10th generation chip on Amazon is not available. A lot of 10th generation chips by themselves are not available, just like the 5000 series on AMD's chips are not available because they just came out and they're sold out. Again, 2020 COVID manufacturing warehouse issues and so forth. If you're buying a pre-built system of a desktop or a laptop, most likely you're going to find a 10th generation Intel chip inside of it or that uh, 3000 series for the AMD or potentially a 5000 series AMD chip inside the laptops. But I think AMD is just a little bit behind with those pre-built systems compared to Intel. Moving on to motherboards, stay with me. It's a lot of information, but I want you to be able to decipher these codes and what this is and these descriptions, because again, far too often folks just go for the most expensive thing and then try to decipher the next one down and go, well, we don't need that triple net M2 or a sync when we can just get, I want you to be able to understand what you're looking at. So motherboards, the brand that I recommend is Asus. I've used them for a very long time, A-S-U-S, and maybe pronounce something else. I've always pronounced it as Asus. There's other companies like MSI, uh, Intel makes their own motherboards and so forth. They're good companies. I've just used Asus for a long time. And this is also where we're gonna start talking about the classification of gaming. Anytime that you look, and this is just a quick note, anytime you look for a laptop or computer, if it says it's a gaming computer, the peripherals and components of hardware inside of it are applicable to the graphics work you're doing inside of Photoshop, video editing, 3D editing, all that kind of stuff. And yes, you can play some killer video games with those computers and systems. Those components are being built for that, and that's why it's being classified as gaming. So, looking at this Asus, this is made for the LGA1200. This is the socket for Intel, as we saw here, the LGA1200. So we know that this is only made for Intel. It will not fit an AMD chip. Key factor you wanna look at. Motherboards are the body of the computer. The CPU, the video cards, the hard drives, the memory, 
all the peripherals of the computer tower, the laptop, they all connect to it. So on a laptop or computer, if you have USB ports, it's being connected to the motherboard. It's just a little wire, a little housing that goes right to the motherboard. So you need those peripherals in the motherboard and you want those modern versions of those peripherals. Things like Bluetooth 5.1, the Wi-Fi, you want it to be, as, and the LAN, you want it to be as fast as possible. This is Wi-Fi 6. So it's, it's going to be able to take the mesh Wi-Fi systems that are becoming popular in homes now. So you can get those really fast speeds via Wi-Fi. You need the connection inside of the motherboard itself to be able to pick up on that. This has a built-in Wi-Fi connection. It's got a little antenna that comes out the back. If you don't have that, you can buy a Wi-Fi card that goes into the motherboard itself to provide that option. But this is built in. Here. DDR4, this is referencing memory. So this means that it needs current generation DDR4 memory. That's a classification for memory. And we'll explain that when we get to the memory chips here in a second. And it means that it can take 4,800 and higher. It can take lower, of course, but it's optimized for 4,800 and higher as far as the processing speed of the memory. So it's looking for an Intel chip. It's got current generation of Wi-Fi. It's got current generation for memory. It can handle pretty fast memory. It's got great fast speeds for ethernet connections, wire connections. It's got Intel LAN, that's just essentially Intel's backup wife or uh, ethernet, and then Bluetooth 5.1. This triple M period two, this references hard drives, and that's what we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, but next we're gonna talk about video cards, but I want you to remember that, the triple M2, and we'll call back to it in just a minute. So this is 383 for this one. This Asus ROG Maximus 12 Hero, that's just the model name of it, and I think it's Royal Royal Opera of Gaming. I don't know what it's called. I don't know what the ROG stands for. As you see, there's other ASUS options. This is where we're gonna to touch on for the first time talking about that basic rule of consumerism that you pay for what you get. So 383 for this one up here versus 179 for this one. If we look at this one, it's an LGA 1151. This is an older generation socket for chips from Intel. Intel 8th and 9th generation. 9th generation chips from Intel, they're not bad. AMD is faster and better, but they're not bad. So this would work for that. You've got the DDR4 here. You've got an HDMI connection. So if you have a, a monitor that needs an HDMI cable to it, you've got that pre-built connection that's hardwired into the motherboard, which means the motherboard has a graphics processor inside of it or a video card, so to speak, already. But it's not one you would rely upon for doing Photoshop. It's going to handle bare minimum. It's got the M2 slot for a hard drive. And again, we'll talk about those in just a minute. This has got some good current gen stuff of USB 3.1. USB 2.0 is what we've had forever in a day, and then three, and then 3.1. And then there's the USB-C connections. You want those more modern peripherals because you don't wanna to have to change out the body of your computer in a couple of years. With the faster connections, it isn't just things like charging your phone with a more modern version of a USB. It's also things like if you need, especially for laptops, if you need an external hard drive. If the laptop only comes with one hard drive inside and you need an external to store pictures and music and movies and so forth, you need a USB connection that's fast so that it can process that information. If you have an older USB connection and you don't have the output for it for faster USB connections in the motherboard, that's where you're gonna have a bottleneck of information and it's gonna slow things down for you. So as we look at some other comparisons here of the ASUS uh, versions here, here's an ASUS that's for AMD AM4. This is only going to process an AMD chip, not an Intel chip. This one's for third generation Ryzen chips. The 3000 series I think is technically considered the fourth generation chips. So this is a little bit of an outdated motherboard, but it's gonna be the motherboard that will handle the chip that I just bought. This has got all the updated versions of Wi-Fi. It's got um, the USB 3.2 and so forth. Just very briefly explaining some of this, the PCIe 4.0, this means that it's different connections for other pieces of hardware and where it will actually plug into the motherboard itself. PCIe is the methodology of how that tr information is transferred. So you had older versions of stuff and the way it was connected. New stuff is connected by PCIe and it's got you know the 4.0. The NVIDIA SLI, this means that two video cards can be slaved together so you can have double the power of video cards. For Photoshop, not necessary. For video rendering, for video editing, 3D rendering, sure. For an epic Saturday night of video games, two video cards, woo, look out, I'm gonna destroy you in those games. However, not necessary for Photoshop. 
The 14 plus two power stages, this is referencing uh, ultimately how a power supply is gonna connect to the motherboard. The 14 plus two means that you're gonna be able to get a lot more power to the system. And that's key for things like having two video cards slaved together, having the current updated ports so you can plug in your phone and fast charge your phone and not plug it into a USB 2.0 and spend 17 years charging your phone. So that's the information that you wanna look for in those peripherals. Look for the updated, more modern versions of Wi-Fi, USB connections. You wanna make sure that it's the right slot for the CPU that you're looking at. And just ultimately, this is, a motherboard is where you don't wanna skimp on price. You wanna keep some of that money as much as, uh, put as much money into the motherboard as you can afford, but it's it's very important just as much as the CPU itself. Again, here's a great example. This one's $71, again from Asus, great company. Uh, it can take third, second, and first generation Ryzen chips. It is not optimized for third generation chips. It can take it, but it's not optimized for it. This is an old motherboard. You don't want it. Speaks by the price point, look for things in that I would say 250 to $400 range for a good motherboard. Now, if you're looking at a pre-built system, especially a laptop, you're probably not gonna find a lot of information about the motherboard. Looking at the other peripherals, like the CPU, the video card, and so forth, is gonna give you a clear indication that the motherboard can handle it. So you're pretty okay there. So that's motherboards, two down, let's keep going. And uh, hopefully this is not too much. And if you have questions, hit me in those comments and I will get back to you as soon as possible. We're moving on to video cards. Video cards, it's getting a little easier now for explanations, by the way. So when you look at video cards, you're gonna see things like EVGA, NVIDIA, you're gonna see MSI, a whole bunch of other different companies. These are the manufacturers. NVIDIA is the company that actually made these new current gen video cards and AMD is actually making their own video cards now that apparently are the cat's meow. So, but I don't wanna talk about that and confuse you too much. What you wanna look for in a video card, and this is for desktops as well as laptops, is this. You're looking for this, RTX versus GTX. So, GTX cards were the cards that had been around for a very long time. They would have a series number, just like the chips would have. So the Ryzen 3000 series, they had a series numbers too. So the GTX cards were the 1000 series. They started at like 1050 and went up to 1080. And they would have different letters behind them like T and TI and so forth to indicate just a little bit more power in that one versus one that didn't have those little special letters at the end. When NVIDIA created the new video cards, again, a lot of the software inside of it, it isn't so much the components, but it's the software and how it processes information, how it works in conjunction with modern CPUs to process that information. They launched the RTX series of cards. The RTX series of cards launched like six-ish, seven-ish months ago. They became the new top of the line. They started the 2000 series, 2040 up to 2080. And then instead of having TI behind it, it was 20 like 2060 and then 2060 super. <laughs> it's super. It's just a little bit faster than one without the word super next to it. I expect it to make like little Super Mario Brothers sounds when it processes things. Anyway, the 2060 line, the 2000 series, great line. RTX 2000 series, whether it's 2040, 2050, 60, 70, 80. Good line of video cards. Then Nvidia and their infinite wisdom of consumerism in 2020, decided to come out with the 3000 series about a month ago. The 3000 series, significantly better than the 2000 series. 2000 series, fantastic cards. 3000 series, much better. 3000 series, completely sold out across planet Earth. And twice as expensive. All the benchmark tests from reputable sites and sources that test the AMD CPUs against Intel CPUs, same thing with these, they all say that the 3000 series is double the power of the 2000 series, hence double the price. I will not buy a 3000 series RTX card because I just bought a 2060 Super like a few months ago. I love my video card, it's fantastic, it works really well. And I'm gonna be happy with that for a while because I don't wanna spend a thousand dollars on a video card. Photoshop does not need a video card that powerful. So this is where we're gonna get into a little bit of a problem because the GTX line of cards, and I'm scrolling down just to see if we see any here. 
Uh, no, because we I think I searched for just RTX cards. Yeah, I did. So the GTX cards, we're looking at a 2060 Super. This is, I think, the exact card I have. Let's talk about the specifics real quick so we can understand it. RTX 2000 series. This is important. How much memory it has built into the card. This is separate from the actual computer memory, the RAM that we're going to talk about in a second. You want to have as much memory as you can afford in that video card because it's just going to make it that much more powerful. Mine has eight gigs of DDR6, which is the most modern version of, compu of memory for a video card. DDR5 was obviously the, the last generation of it. Six gigabytes is good, four is okay, but really try to push it up there as much as you can and what you can afford. This is expensive. This is more expensive than the CPU that I just bought. But that gives you an indication of how important video cards are becoming in video software, in graphics software, and yes, video games. So let's go look at a GTX card really quickly, just to get a comparison. Uh, let's go with a 1080. Here we go. So GTX, this is a 1050. Here's a 1080. So GTX 1080, this has got eight gigabytes of the older version of memory. This is as souped up as you can get. Super overclocked, it'll go really, really fast. And it's $695. It's more expensive than the RTX 2060 Super we were just looking at. Because it has the ability to be overclocked, it's got some extra software and components in it. This isn't a bad video card, but it is a part of the GTX line. With a GTX line 1000 series, the RTX line of 2000 series, now with the RTX 3000 series, the GTX is the first one that's gonna be pushed out the door. The 2000 series for RTX is gonna become the baseline that's affordable, and the 3000 series will surpass that. Not right away, probably a couple years, but that's what it's going to be. So when you look at pre-built systems, you're going to see either a GTX video card inside of it or an RTX. This is where if you're looking at a pre-built system, especially for a laptop, I strongly recommend going for the RTX because most of the time, the price difference of the overall laptop with an RTX video card in it is gonna be very close to the GTX. The GTX is going out the door. It's old fashioned. You wanna look at the new fashion, which is the RTX series. But if you're trying to save some money, you can go to a 1050 Ti, pretty powerful. It's only got four gigs instead of the eight. It's not going to be overclocked and super fast, but it's $129. It's affordable. This is not a video card I would purchase. I want something that's got more power to it. I want something that's got more memory to it. These are the G, uh, DDR5, the older version of memory. The new DDR6, much more powerful. Hence the price points. Again, it's consumerism. But video cards are just as important again for photoshop graphics editing software as the cpu motherboard and so forth so try not to to get something that again you don't have to go something that's crazy at 739 dollars but try to get into that realm of that two to three hundred dollar range look at the rtx line and see if that's something you can afford if you can't come down to the gtx line against the same system 1040 1050 1060 1070 1080 and then the TIs, which are the super versions of being sped up. But the key component here is that memory. How much memory is inside of it? Yes, it can be overclocked and all that kind of stuff, but how much memory is inside? That's the key. So let's move on to RAM, the actual computer memory itself, not the memory that's inside the video card. I've always used Corsair as a company. It's a good company, crucial. I believe Samsung actually makes memory, I think, or SanDisk maybe. Anyway, so Corsair, good company for memory. Key component you're looking for here is the amount of memory. You're gonna have things like Corsair Vengeance RGB Pro. This is just a classification. The RGB means it has a sticker on it. And the Pro means it's probably just a touch faster than, than another version. So right now, looking at this one, this is a total of 64 gigabytes of memory. Now, Photoshop, it's minimum system requirement, minimum. I believe is four gigabytes of memory. It's recommended is 16 gigabytes. It used to be eight and jumped up to 16. That tells me that again, Photoshop and other graphic software is pushing forward in innovation, definitely relying upon things like the video card and the system memory itself, the RAM. 
So you're getting 64 gigabytes of memory. This is a lot. I think this is overkill at 279. So you understand too, you're getting two 32 gigabyte sticks of memory. On your motherboard, you're gonna have four slots most of the time for memory. So you have two 32 gigabyte sticks. That means technically you could add two more and have the 120 blah, 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 blah. You need to make sure your motherboard will actually support that much memory. Some motherboards don't go that high. It just won't allow that much memory. Look at this price point, 279. If we come down here, we're at 32 gigabytes, two 16 gigabyte sticks. 32 gigabytes is what I have on my computer. So that's double what Adobe is recommending for Photoshop at 149. Pretty big price jump here. So that works out. You would think that's a good thing. DDR4, sounds good. That's the classification of its, its generation, if you will, of chip, of, of stick, of memory. 3600, this is its speed in megahertz of how fast it's gonna process that information. So 36 megahertz here, 36 megahertz, DDR4, I'm getting 32 gigabytes for 150 bucks. I can get 64 for 279. I would recommend this one. 32 gigabytes, definitely what more than what you need because again, 16 gigabytes is what's recommended for my Adobe. But let's take a look at this one up here. This is 249. It's got 16 gigabytes total, less than this one down here. 32, 64, it's only got 16. And it's the same price point as this one, hop, skip, and a jump, right? Why? Because DDR4, but it's a faster megahertz, processes at 4,400 instead of 3,600. So 16 gigabytes, what Adobe recommends, at 4,400 megahertz, faster, better, stronger. Million Dollar Man? Yeah. So is it Million Dollar Man? Anyway, this would be something I would recommend. It's faster and it's stronger and it's better. However, you're only dealing with 16 gigabytes. That's the bare minimum. That's, that's what's recommended for Adobe right now. Here, you're getting double. And yes, this is a fall off at 3600 versus 4400 megahertz, but not that significant. So 150 budget purchase here. If you want to go the fastest at the recommended amount, 249. If you want to just be the big kid on the block, there you go, 279. You got 64 gigabytes of memory. Make sure the motherboard can support it. Let's move on to hard drives. Hard drives, bear with me again, a lot of information. Here we go. Two types of hard drives in the modern age. You're either going to be dealing with, well, let's go back, core basic you're dealing with a hard drive that's called an SSD or a solid state drive. Hard drives in the past used to be these big rectangles that had actual moving spinning plates with a little needle that would write information to it. Those plates were fraught with peril. They would spin too fast, they'd overheat, the plates would crash and hit, and then all the data is gone. SSDs have no moving parts inside of them. This is a solid state drive made by Samsung. This is also a solid state drive made by Samsung. There's two variations between these. This one is faster, this one is not. So let's start breaking it down. Samsung 870 QVO blah, blah, blah model number. SATA, SATA 3 is how it connects to the computer, how it connects to the motherboard, how information is transferred from the hard drive to the CPU, to the memory, to all the different stuff that it needs. This is a connection that's been around for a very long time. It's grown from SATA 1 to SATA 3. SATA replaced old systems of how old hard drives would connect. There is a new way that these connect, and it's the NVMe. This is where that M.2 comes into play. So this here for this hard drive, this is the interface and distinction of how the information is sent from this hard drive to the computer. This is faster. So when we talked about that motherboard that said, here, it's got dual M2 slots. Where was the one up here? It's got triple M2 slots. It means that it has the capability of having three of these installed into the motherboard. Now, a motherboard that has three M2 slots is definitely going to have plenty of SATA slots, so you can have multiple hard drives inside of your computer. The M2 slot is faster. So my recommendation with hard drives is this. In a desktop and in a laptop, have two hard drives. One, your primary hard drive, your C drive, if you will, is your M.2. This one's gonna house your operating system, all of your software like Photoshop and video editing, Spotify, all that kind of stuff 
is going to be on this hard drive. Then you have a second hard drive that is a SATA hard drive that is your storage. All your pictures, your video files, your music, uh, your scratch drive for Photoshop. Scratch drive is ultimately what Photoshop will output a lot of access information as you're working. This is the working drive it works off of. It's using information that's stored in the memory, but it's storing some of that also back into a hard drive or it's scratch drive. The SATA 3 connection for this means that ultimately, one, it's how it's processing the information sent to the computer, but the SATA 3 distinction is for an SSD hard drive, it can go higher in its storage capacity than the M2s can. The M2s, by their very nature of how they're built, it's a smaller storage capacity. So this is why the M2s are faster, but are generally used for the operating system, the software itself. So when you open Photoshop, it's being called from this one, which moves information faster than this one does, the SATA 3. But the SATA has more storage. Now the SATA is very fast. This one's faster. Price points, this is really good price points. And again, at the time it's recording, they're on sale. You can look again for like a 870 Pro and EVO instead of a QVO and so forth. They're just different models, variations on the theme of how fast they move the information or the storage capacity. Definitely recommend at least a 500 gigabyte M.2. If you can get a one terabyte for $159 or $49, definitely do it because Windows and Photoshop and a few other programs are gonna easily eat up two or 300 gigabytes. So you gotta be careful on the capacity for that drive that's gonna house all of the major software of the computer itself. Storage drives, two to three terabytes, one terabyte, whatever you need. I have two four terabyte SSDs, SATAs, into my computer, and I have one one terabyte M.2. All of my software is stored on this one, and these two drives are redundant drives that back up everything and mirror to each other every single night. Then I have three external hard drives that are connected to the computer that essentially are my triple redundancy of backups. So that if I have a fatal crash inside the computer, there's living backups. And we can talk about that another time. If you'd like to know more about that, let me know in the comments below about how I do data processing and backups. So hard drives, recap. You wanna look for an M2 and a SATA 3. Recommend an M2 as your main primary system and then the SATA 3 as storage for your hard drives. Now we've hit the five majors. We're good, we're almost done. Keep moving as fast as we can go. Power supplies, power supplies are very important. It powers the entire computer. You want to look, uh, Corsair, again, a good company, makes memory. Thermaltake makes power supplies, a bunch of other companies. I like Corsair and I've used Thermaltake in the past. You've purchased another variation two times of this, so clearly I like Corsair. Uh, start at 650. Don't go to 550. Start at 650 or 750. You want as much power as possible. 650 is $69 and 750 is probably not available. $30 more. I would go 650. And what's 550? Just for giggles. 550 is $69? $79. $10 more, get the extra 100 watts because this is powering everything in your computer. You need more power. If there is a fatal system failure because there isn't enough power to the system, you can cause damage to your system. Get a good power supply. Make sure that it has all of the different connections that you need. So especially if you get that motherboard that has that 14 plus two power stages, you wanna make sure you have a power supply that connects to that. It will be in the description of the power supply itself. Cooling for the CPU. This is a liquid cooler. A CPU cooler used to be a fan. So it was a little uh, thermal little pipes that would go down and sit on top of this tiny little chip. And it's this massive cube inside of your computer with fans on it that is pulling air into it and trying to pull the heat off of the CPU. Those types of fans are kind of outdated. They, they cannot do as well to keep the chip cool, especially if you overclock the chip. Liquid cooling, it's been around for a very long time. It got a bad rap for many years because when liquid cooling came out, you actually had to put water into the cooler. You had to change it. The pipes could burst and get water inside your computer. Your computer was destroyed. All kinds of horror stories. They are so modern and so powerful now. Self-sufficient systems. You don't have to put water into this. It comes with the liquid coolant inside of it. You never have to replace it. The pipes are very safe and protected. Yes, technically something could go wrong. It's very unlikely. When you're putting together a desktop computer and you're using liquid cooling, just make sure that any of the pipes are not in the, in near any internal fans of the tower itself. 
and the tower should come with a couple of little fans because it needs to pull air into it, then the liquid cooler uses air from the outside to keep the CPU just itself chilled and cool. So uh, the, the size of it, how many fans, two fans, three fans, the overall size, you just wanna make sure that it fits your actual CPU and it's going to tell you that in the description. This one fits an AMD Ryzen, Intel LGA 1200 1151. It's gonna fit all the AMD chips. It's gonna pretty much fit every Intel chip in existence. So this one will work for you. It's a good, it's $63. It's great, cooler. You can get three fans, two fans, doesn't matter. Just make sure it fits your actual tower if you're putting it into a desktop. Oh boy, that was a lot of information. So here we go. Looking at pre-built systems. Now that you've understood all of that, and I know it was so much to go through, but breaking it down piece by piece of understanding how this is categorized can help you when it comes to this. When you're looking at a pre-built system so you can understand how companies start to put older stuff but flashy things in it to not get you to pay attention. So let's look at this one here. This is an Asus laptop. I have an Asus laptop that I absolutely love. Let's go through the specs of it. Gaming laptop, there you go, you know it's gonna work for you. 17.3 inch display. It's a wider display, most of the time they're 15.6 or 15.3. You want the 17.3, bigger space, a bigger monitor, especially if you're gonna be using it for something like Photoshop. 144 hertz display. Most displays are 60 to 75 hertz monitors. The 144 hertz is going to move the, the screen, its refresh rate is even faster. Is that applicable into Photoshop? Not as much. A 75 hertz process, uh, uh, refresh is, is fine. 144 really kind of applies more to video games. The faster that things move on the screen as you're playing the game, that's where that comes into play. But what is important for graphics software like Photoshop is the IPS. So full HD in plane switching is what IPS means. So when you're looking at a laptop and you have IPS, you'll see all the colors and all the brightness as you're looking directly at it. But if you tilt and move, those colors and light stay the same with an IPS, in-plane switching. If it doesn't have it, then when you tilt to the left, you're going to see like a weird version of the picture. You're not gonna see all the colors, you have to come back to center. So if you're using Photoshop on a laptop without IPS in the monitor, you have to keep right onto it and not move, because even just the slightest movement, like your phone, if you're using your phone, you don't have an OLED display or whatever, the light and the sun, it's gonna cause issues, you won't be able to see everything as clearly. So IPS, strongly recommended. The NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2070, that's the video card inside of it. It's a good video card, works great, I think that's wonderful. A Core i7 chip, it's the 10th generation of chip, I don't know how fast it is, but ultimately, good chip modern version of the chip, there you go. 16 gigabytes of DDR4 memory. That's the recommended amount from Adobe. I would like it if it had 32, but most of the time you're only gonna find 16 in laptops. When you go up to 32, you're gonna see the price go up. You can generally buy new memory modules because the laptops, motherboards, this is probably actually two eight gigabyte chips, sticks inside of it. So you would probably, if you wanted to upgrade, you would have to ditch those and get two 16 gigabyte sticks to go to the 32. Here's the problem with this one. It's got a 512 gigabyte PCIe. It's the small little M2. It's not, a, it's not actually an M2, it's a PCIe connection instead of M2. This is the only hard drive inside of it. That's not a lot of space. So my laptop from Asus is almost identical to this one, except it's an older generation of the, uh, I think it's the i9 chip, but it has a uh, M2 hard drive in it and it's 512 gigabytes. It doesn't have a second one in it. So uh, that's why I carry external hard drives with me when I use my laptop. The rest of this is just fancy. If you can find a laptop that has two hard drives in it, probably the better way to go. Because again, most of the software is gonna eat up a lot of this space. So you won't be able to store a lot of pictures or movies or music or so forth on it because there just isn't the information. That's why you need an external hard drive, which is why you need to pay attention to things like, does it have USB 3.1? Does it have USB-C? fast connections for those external hard drives to be able to move that information. This laptop is 1449, 1450, let's say. Not bad. Let's scroll up, 1439, $10 less. 2020 by Asus, good, modern, Strix, whatever, smaller monitor, yeah, full HD, but no IPS. i7, ninth generation chip, not 10. Backlit keyboard, GeForce GTX 1650. Old video card, not as old as the 1050s, 
but old. Kind of on its way out. It's got the HDMI port if you want to connect a monitor or whatever else, Windows 10, blah, 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 blah. Here's the reason why it's almost the same price point is because it's got 32 gigabytes of memory. I'm sure it's probably DDR4, but it's got a two terabyte, not a solid state drive, a normal hard drive, and then a two terabyte solid state drive. So it's got two drives. So you'd be like, well, dude, this got two drives, 32 gigabytes of memory. It's ninth generation. That's not that bad. Whatever the video card for 1439 for 1449, you can get a way better video card, 10th generation chip. Yes. Less memory. These are the trade-offs. This is why I wanted to give you that long dissertation of all of that information of tech. Because these are the kinds of things that you're going to find when you're looking for an upgrade for a laptop or a desktop. Some components are going to be replaced with others. Arguably to me, if you're going for a laptop, hands down, it's about this monitor. It's about the IPS. It's about that video card. I can handle carrying around a portable hard drive. And if I need more memory eventually, I can replace the memory for two or 300 bucks at best. Dealing with stuff that's already outdated. And every time tech jumps forward, which is going to jump forward in three months, March next year, 2021, they're going to announce all kinds of new stuff. This stuff is just going to age that much faster and the price is going to go down to 999. So that's how you look at these things. That's how you begin to decipher these elements of tech and information and ultimately be able to land in a place that gives you the most value for the money that you're willing to spend. So. I know it was a lot of information to throw at you. Let me uh, jump back to a full screen here. There's a lot of information to throw at you. This is a super long video. I apologize. It's a lot to go over. If you have questions, hit me in those comments. Let me know. I will answer them as fast as possible. Be conscientious of what you're looking at. Again, all those five key components of technology is important. CPU, memory, motherboard, video card, and hard drives. It's, it's hard to, to, to rob Peter to pay Paul for those. Just try to make the best investment possible and make sure that you are not getting one key component that is antiquated compared to the rest. So that finishes this video as far as the technology talk is concerned. And here's the personal part of it at the very end. In 2018, my father passed away of cancer. And it was a devastating experience that I went through with my siblings and family and with my wife, my wonderful wife that we've been married for 10 years. I was able to be with my father in the hospital and through skilled rehab and then finally eventually hospice and I was there with him the moment he left this world. I was there with my family who was in the room. I was able to support them and help them in their times of need. Last week on Wednesday, my wonderful wife's mother at 69 years old, 68, 69, she passed away. She had had a heart attack seven, eight weeks ago, and she was in the process of recovering from that. She was in a facility, a skilled rehab facility, recovering, and she contracted COVID. Essentially, somebody in the facility, whether it was a guest visiting, an employee, they didn't take the precautions they needed to. Either they were sick and they knew it or they didn't know it. It's certainly very plausible that it was an accident. She was diagnosed with COVID and pneumonia, she was moved to hospice a few days later. She passed away. My wife and her siblings twice a day were able to communicate with her for about 10 minutes via Zoom. That's all. She was in a bad state. Half the time she was not really able to communicate with them. They told her stories, they sung her songs and they said goodbye to their mother over a computer. I watched my wife go through one of the most tragic events that you'll go through in your life when you lose a parent. And she had to do it looking at a laptop. This isn't about politics. This is about human life. I beg of you. Please be safe. Please wear a mask. Please protect the lives around you of strangers as much as you would protect your own. 
There have been a few times in the past few months where I've forgotten my mask. And I feel foolish. There's been a few times that I've been in situations where I forgot to take it. And I've got to meet people and they want to reach out and shake my hand and I back away. I don't want to get into politics and hype, but I want to protect people. I want to know that I will never be responsible for another family having to say goodbye over a computer. Please keep yourself safe, especially as we enter into the holiday seasons. Please protect the people around you. Protect human life. We can all go forward together and stay alive. That ends this video. If you like the content you found in today's video, please give the video a like and consider subscribing to the channel because new content will continue to debut each week in photography and Photoshop education. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell icon so you'll be notified of that content when you return to the YouTubes. Thank you for watching today. And until next time, I'll see you out there in the world of Photoshop.